Hello, welcome to the June 13th, 2018, The Nutritionist webinar. I am Marianne Fessenden from AMTS and your English language host. This monthly webinar series is dedicated to providing technical talks from internationally recognized educators for listeners around the world. Paula Torillo from Cordoba, Argentina translates and hosts the Spanish language webinar. Tom Long from Hemingway in China will be hosting in Mandarin. There will be a question and answer period immediately following the presentation. Listeners can submit questions through me, Paula, or Tom. A complete recording of archived webinars, as well as a question and answer session for each, will be available on the AMTS website. For those of you who would listen to the presentations while driving, we have converted the videos into MP3 files that can be downloaded to your device for offline listening. This month, we are very pleased to host Dr. Gordy Jones, veterinarian, nutritional consultant, and partner of Central Sands Dairy in Nacusa, Wisconsin. Dr. Gordy Jones is an independent dairy performance consultant and a partner at Central Sands Dairy, LLC. He has consulted with dairy producers and veterinarians across the U.S. and globally regarding herd performance, nutrition, dairy cow environment and housing, expansion, dairy management, personal SOPs, and cow comfort. He is a much sought after consultant and speaker on the dairy nutrition and management. His talk today will focus on providing the diet that your transition cow needs to ensure health and success as fresh cows. Thank you, Gordy, for joining us. To the audience, if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the chat or the question and answer window. We'll answer them at the end of the presentation. Okay, Gordy, you should be good to go. It says I am now the presenter. Thank you, and go ahead. Thank you, Marianne, for, and AMTS very much for inviting me to come and speak. Well, to be at home and speak. Um, and I want to thank uh, our world listeners in China, Argentina, the rest of the U.S. for uh, taking time out to uh, listen to an old veterinarian talk about fresh cows. So... Um, I'm pretty thrilled to be here. Those of you that haven't done a webinar, you know I'm lying because doing a webinar at home alone, I've got three wolfhounds right now who are sitting in my office looking at me intently, wondering why I'm speaking to myself. So, and if you haven't done a webinar, it's a little bit wondering if you're out there. So thanks for being there and uh, we'll move on. So just a little more about me. I've been a veterinarian my whole life. Uh, every now and then my wife reminds me when I used to be a vet. But my problem with being a veterinarian a million years ago was in my first dairy practice, my best day was often my dairyman's worst day. It was a little hard for a young veterinarian to be hoping for another displaced abomasum so I could do surgery and show how keen I was to help dairymen and hoping they had DAs. In fact, when I was excited that a hundred cow dairymen had three DAs, he said, Gordy, your job is to stop this. Your job is to not be so damn excited when we've got one. So I went from being a regular veterinarian doing regular practice to starting to consult on dairy nutrition, facilities, and cow comfort. And between two mentors in, um, in facilities, Bill Bickert in facilities and Jack Albright at Purdue in uh, Cow Comfort, they both changed how I looked at dairy cows. As a veterinarian, I knew that if the ration was wrong, the facilities were bad, or the comfort was miserable, I had more work to do. So I went upstream, if you will, and said, let's prevent our nutritional problems our pneumonia problems in facilities and go to cow comforting. And uh, from there, I started to do uh, dairy nutrition facility cow comfort consulting. I got recruited by Monsanto and headed for the West Coast. I was, um, by the end of year three, I was in charge of the expansion team internally for Monsanto and helped many large dairies across the U.S. expand and build new facilities. And in that role, I was the designer of Fair Oaks Dairies. And uh, after fixing a dry cow fresh cow problem at Fair Oaks as they started, 
they invited me to come and be the nutritionist and manager at one of the managers at Fair Oaks. So um, I jumped on the team. It was my dream to now do my rations on my dairies and implement the whole management plan facility, if you will. And then after six years at Fair Oaks, they teamed up with me and I built a dairy farm in the central sands of Wisconsin. So I spent, after building my dairy, I spent five years, the first five years managing it, putting together a team, managing the dairy and having a ball. After five years, I stepped down as the manager and I'm currently consulting again. As you can see, here I have a five or six year attention span or literally I just can't hold a job. Not sure which. Anyway, I'm back to consulting now across Europe. I probably consulted in more than 37 countries today uh, on facilities, nutrition, and cow comfort. And uh, this is home right now for me at my dairy. This is the front pay, front front of Central Sands Dairy. You can see it looks an awful lot like a Northwoods Lodge, even like a Cabela's, where I spend most of my money. So. Let's talk about dry cow programs and really take a new look at an old way. We really want to make fresh cows. Across the world, in every country, there's been a failure of the transition period. We've been afraid to freshen healthy, fresh cows. So we've looked at this, and heaven forbid she should have two calves, because that would even scare us more. We've just been afraid to make a healthy, fresh cow or have been unable to make a healthy fresh cow. And it's been a matter of too little or too much. Or how do we get it just right? I used to call this dry cow program the high fiber, low energy program. But the team at Illinois under Jim Drakeley, they renamed it, one of his grad students renamed it the Goldilocks method because it's just right. Too much, cows have gotten too fat, We've had too much weight loss, too much time in the dry cow pen. A cow with 100 days in the dry cow pen is often a death sentence across the US or the world dairy industry. Too much energy, too many lactations, calves, grain, overcrowding. And our list of too little is too little body condition. Too little time in the dry cow pen. Cows with a short dry cow period don't rebuild lactational tissue. So I need you out there to do six weeks dry minimum, 42 days. Too little selenium, you know the problems of white muscle disease in our calves and downer cows. Too little cow comfort, that goes without saying. When cows are risk the last 10 days of their dry cow period, they're at risk for mastitis. Well, if they don't have the comfort in clean free stalls or a clean bed to lay in, uh, they can get mastitis. Too little dry matter intake means they won't eat when they freshen, and we'll talk a lot about that today. Too little fiber, uh, we'll talk a lot about that. Too little protein means we don't make enough colostrum, and we'll give you some tips there. Too little magnesium, and we get grass tetany and down cows. So here it is. You've got the slide, too much, too little. It's a potpourri of problems. And now let's move past those to just right. Okay, so nutrition, making all rations work. I don't care if it's a dry cow ration or a milk cow ration. To make a ration work on a dairy takes all of these parts. The ration in the center, consistency and routine have to be the same day in and day out. We have to use high quality feedstuffs. We've got to have people and job performance and cow comfort. Together, all four of those components will make our ration work and then the cows can perform. So it's putting all of those together, consistency, feed quality, people, cow comfort, that makes a ration work well. Okay, my rations that work well at Central Sands or across all of my dairy clients, these would be rations for milk cows that work best. Just a quick Point four, high forage rations. The higher, the lower the NDF you can make your alfalfas, grass leach, and your corn silage, the more digestible your forage, the more forage I can have. My current ration at Fair, 
at Central Sands is now over 63% forage. So high forage rations work best for me. I use no more than four kilos, nine pounds dry matter, from feeds with a 40% NDF that are not forage. Those are byproduct feeds. So whether it's cottonseed, DDG, distiller's grain, whether it's corn gluten, whether it's brewers, if it's a byproduct, it's usually high in NDF and low in effective fiber. I won't put more than four kilos dry matter of that in the total ration or my rate of passages get too high. The energy slips through my cows and I get a hind gut problem called HBS, hemorrhagic bowel syndrome, which has a first and last name. If you're suffering from HBS, it is a nutritional problem caused by people. Okay, butter fats for Holsteins need to be above 375. Jersey's above 365. That tells me that my ration is rocking in the cradle of fiber. So those are the rations that work really best. I always have rumensin on board from a womb to tomb things, and my milk cow rations are above 420 milligrams per cow per day, so that my lowest intake cow gets more than 320 milligrams. Okay, across the world, there's been a failure of the fresh cows, failure of the transition period. Really, it's been mastite. Wait a minute, we can go back and think about pigs for a minute. Pigs get a disease called MMA, mastitis, metritis, agalactia. Who cares about pigs? Well, pigs get it from eating too much grain before they farrow. And our fresh cows get mastitis, metritis, agalactia, RPs, downers, milk fever, DAs. We've just had a wreck. Okay, so what have we tried? I'm going to back up for a second. When I was really frustrated as a veterinarian that my dairymen were having lots of problems, I would about once a year send out an essay to my clients. And that essay would be about the little village that was downstream. The little village downstream doesn't remember when the first bodies appeared in the river, but they were there. So they tried to rescue the bodies and they got boats and they manned the boats with men and women who could row the boats out and pull the drowning victims in. They also put a watchtower up, and now they watch the river day and night with lights on the river for nighttime. They were watching the river day and night, manning the boats 24 hours a day, and pulling the people ashore, realizing they needed medical supervision. So now they built a first aid station that became a hospital. The little village downstream doesn't remember when the bodies first appeared, but now they were proud that they were saving 99.9% .9 of the drowning victims in their river. Nobody in the village downstream asked what was happening upstream. Somebody went up to the national park, put a guardrail on the cliff, and now there were no bodies in the river. A watchtower went out of work, the boats went out of work, and a hospital went out of work. And then at the bottom of the essay, I would ask my dairyman, is your herd working upstream or downstream? What have we tried? Mostly what we've tried have been downstream fixes. We've tried close up programs. We've tried to do things in the close up period to help make better fresh cows. We've done steam up programs because we've thought in the past that you can't go from zero milk to almost 200 pounds on some of the best herds, best cows, without some kind of steaming up. Well, I'm here to tell you, you don't have to steam them up. We've done 10 day programs. Okay, we'll identify the cows for 10 days and try and find those that are drowning. We'll pull them out of the river and we'll offer all kinds of first aid. We've done drenching programs. I probably have enough veterinarians listening to this program that if I ask them what they do for their fresh cows, how they take an off-feed fresh cow and what they drench her with, I'd get five or six different formulas. So some dairies drench all of their fresh cows. I can't believe it, but they do. The industry 
The pharmaceutical industry has taught us that oral calcium post-fresh will prevent hypocalcemia, both subclinical and perhaps milk fever. So we have many drug companies today that are offering us calcium boluses at fresh. It's been another downstream fix to try and prevent problems. We've looked at a monitoring program for ketosis with BHB testing. So now we're starting to bleed all cows at five to seven days to see who has ketosis that we'll now offer treatment to. We've done short dry cow periods. Short dry cow periods, cows are having trouble with dry cow periods, so let's make them shorter. In fact, we've tried no dry cow periods. We'll just feed her the milk cow ration and she'll be fine. Uh, we've tried multiple milkings of fresh cows, uh, three, four, six times a day, trying to get a fresh cow to start. And then the doozy for me, I was at World Bouyatrics in Dublin, and somebody presented a paper that said fresh cows get ketosis. No big thrill there, no big change. And ketosis is an energy disease. So they said, let's not take so much energy out of the cow. And what they did was offer once a day milkings. I almost fell out of my seat. I wanna thank Mike Overton for stopping me from yelling out how stupid I thought that was, but I waited till the end of the program and said, I get it, ketosis is energy and you're not milking her one time to stop taking energy out of her. <laughs> I said, why don't you simply don't milk fresh cows? And they told me that would be silly and stupid. And I said, so is once a day milking. These are all downstream solutions to an upstream problem. Let's go upstream. Let's go from the transition area to upstream. So that's the Goldilocks dry cow program. How do we get it just right? It's cow comfort, it's lower the energy, raise the fiber, and get a cow to simply eat more while she's dry. I want you to refer you to Dr. Jim Drakeley's work at the University of Illinois and followed up by Phil Cardosa at the University of Illinois. They've taken this program and uh, they're the owners of it. They've done the science behind how we were feeding cows. So they've done a super job. Okay, displaced abomasums. The U.S. industry have a goal to be somewhere below or at four to six percent DA rate. I've even heard it said oftentimes by nutritionists in the Northeast that you need to have a few DAs to simply know we were pushing hard enough. Pushing, if I ever hear somebody say we're pushing our cows, I'm going to want to pop them in the nose. We don't push cows. We allow cows to perform by giving them great housing, great comfort, and great rations. And then milk is the absence of stress. So let's remove stress. Let's not push cows. Okay, most gold dairies have a goal to be below 4%. Uh, less than 1% is very achievable. Here's some data. This is a herd at Fair Oaks a long time ago, 3,228 freshenings, 15 DAs for the year. If we look at that, 15 DEAs divided by 3,200 freshenings is one half of 1% DEAs per year. If I go back and we look at months like July, June here, they had 300 freshenings, one DEA. Look at February, March, and April in the Northern Hemisphere. In the springtime, we have an abundance of DEAs. Well, 150, 150, and 270 is almost 600 fresh cows and no DAs in that 600 fresh cow period. And then a little stumble of 1%, back to a third of a percent, 450 cows, that got us our half percent for the year. So we can stop DAs. We can make them almost a thing of the past. What about cows who spend too much time in the dry cow pen? Currently on some herds across the world, if a cow spent four months in the dry cow pen, it might become a death sentence. She'd get fat, she'd get ketosis when she freshens, uh, she'd go off feed, a DA, and she might even die. I'm gonna show you a herd, and I have to admit this was my herd 10 years ago. I had bought cows all the way from Ohio. I had bought an 800 cow herd. They got on a bus. It took four hours to load them on the bus. 
They rode buses all the way to my dairy, which was 16 hours. They came through Chicago. I think they stopped at Navy Pier. And on the way up to my herd, it took 16 hours. So some of these cows went more than 20 hours without milking. What do you think that does to a cow who's two months away, three months away from drying off? If she misses a milking or two, takes a bus ride through Chicago, gets to Central Sands, gets off into a new environment, she gets on my rotary and simply says to me, try and get milk out of me. I'm not milking anymore. So now they go in the dry cow pen for a longer period of time. This graph on the vertical axis is the first projection. And it's first projection for all cows that have been in the dry cow period more than 70 days. So on the horizontal axis, the Y axis, we go out six months. So we've got cows from 70 days dry here, most of this Ohio herd, all the way to 180 days dry. And the R square value, the relationship of first milk to days in the dry cow period is an R squared of 0, 0.00. Uh, we did a backslash B, so we have all the cows in here. We have the live cows, the dead cows, the whole herd. Now, I want to show you the whole herd to show you that I can do a 60-day dry cow period. Here's the cows that did 40 to 60 days dry. And then here's the Ohio herd sticking out. The R squared value of all of our cows is the relationship between first projection and days in the dry cow period. She can now spend 100 days, 120, 160 days, even six months in the dry cow period. Looks like this last heifer got pregnant in my dry cow period at 270. A little scary there. Now look at the cows who had under 40 days dry. All of the cows are below. There are no cows above the line. Well, this one cow, I've just taken her out. So these cows have gotten there from one of three reasons, probably at my herd. An abortion, that gives them a short dry cow period. A mismatched pregnancy day, that will give them a short dry cow period. Or failure to get them in the dry cow pen at the right time. My once a week dry cow, they missed her for two or three weeks. So we don't want cows to have shorter than 42 days dry. Okay, too much. We've been through this, too much body condition, weight gain, quins. We've been through this list. It's really, I'm gonna back up here. This is one I wanted to say. Team, it's too much energy and too much grain in the dry cow pen. Okay, dry cow guidelines. I want at least six dry, dry, weeks dry. I can have one or two groups. And one ration, one group can work great. A lot of really high producing herds today are moving cows to the close up 21 days before fresh, but not changing the ration at all. So one ration works great, far off close up, a separate pen for three weeks before calving and make these girls eat. So how do we make them eat? Okay, here's the general guidelines for this ration. So I want no more than four kilograms of dry matter corn silage, no more than eight or nine pounds dry matter corn silage in the ration. I want three to four kilos, that's six to eight pounds, dry matter, chopped straw, high quality, low energy, and it must be chopped short. Short is going to be more, less than two and a half inches, less than two and a half inches, less than a centimeter. All the grain she will ever need will come from the corn silage or your barley silage to the north or small grain silages across the rest of the world. Okay, now no sorting. If she sorts it, you're no longer the nutritionist. Now the cow is. So when I go to a dairy where I've got cows, 30 cows in a dry cow pen sorting, I now have 30 different nutritionists instead of the one balancing the ration. They're all balancing their own rations. If it fails, when it fails, lower the energy if it fails. Yes, these don't add up to 12 kilos. 
the average dry cow will eat somewhere between 12 to 14 kilos dry matter. So the rest of the ration, we can add just about anything as long as we keep the energy low. We can add, at my dairy, what we add is, is dry cow hay, relative value 100, 110, and we get it from neighbors who decide they wanna cut first crop in July. So they have a very mature, tasty first crop that has high NDF and low energy. Okay, here's the dry matter intake with the Goldilocks diets. A far off cow will eat 12 to 14 kilos. A close up cow will eat 11 to 13. In the US, we're talking about 26 to 28 pounds of dry matter, and then 24 for the close up cow. If I take a dry cow, she, the ration is set at 1.32 megacals per kilo. That's 0 0.60 megacals per pound. And if I multiply 1.32 times 12 and a half kilos of dry matter, I get 16 megacals. It's well above the NRC of 14 to 15 megacals of energy. So it's not a low energy ration, it's exactly the right ration. All right, watch this on dry matter ration changes to milk cows. Your ration will turn out to be about 50% forage, a uh, 50% NDF, excuse me, and it will be 100% forage. Okay, 100% forage at 50% NDF. That means a cow who's eating 12 kilos times 50% NDF will have six kilos of space occupying fiber in her rumen. Let me say that one more time. Her rumen is now going to be six to seven kilos of effective fiber. That's how big her rumen is to get the energy she needs. All right, what's that do? I told you already, 1.32 NEL, megacals per kilo times 12 and a half kilos is 16 megacals. All right, here's my dry, my, my milk cow diet for Holsteins has been 23 kilos of dry matter intake and I feed a 60 plus percent for each ration. So I'm feeding 26% NDF from forage. 26% NDF from forage times 23 kilos is six kilos of effective fiber in my room and in my fresh cow, my average cow. Look at that. We've taught the dry cow up here is six kilos of space occupying fiber. She can eat six kilos as a fresh cow. That's how we start cows out so well on this ration. All right, look at it this way. This graph has, is a made up graph. It has dry matter intake on the vertical axis, dry cows close up and fresh. So a cow eating 13 kilos spends the first couple of days trying to decide how much energy she needs. She stabilizes and the dry cows are eating 13 kilos of dry matter intake. We move her to a close up pen. Most or many nutritionists in that close up pen will change the diet to a little more energy and now that group is eating 11 kilos, and then she freshens. But um, on the day she freshens, she goes down in intake. After fresh, she starts and ramps up on dry matter intake. This is the fable that we believe. This is the graph in half of the books I see. But here's what really happens. What happens to dairymen who put more energy in a steam up? or a close-up diet. In your close-up diet, if you change the energy to more energy, here's what happens. The first day she eats those six kilos of NDF, but because the energy density is more, even if she ate the same six kilos, the energy density is more, it's got more energy in it. And because the grain you added, is sand, if you will, it's fine. When the cow eats her fiber, she pulls the grain up. So not only is the energy density of every bite increased by some nutritionist, her intake is increased. 
Well, for two or three or four or five days, she goes up an intake. When she goes up an intake, it takes her three to five days to recognize she's getting more calories. She starts to store these calories. And in the last three to six weeks, she'll store them internally in the fat of her omentum, around her kidneys, in her liver, around her heart. Uh, the inside of the cow will become orange like a pumpkin. And then she will say to herself, right at this point where my little flasher is, I've got too much energy. So she starts a period of going down in energy. Well, remember, our average intake in that pen was 11 kilos. Our average intake was 11. Well, to be 11, the first cows are eating 14. So that means the cow who's freshening is at eight kilos of dry matter. To have an average intake in that pen of 11, with the early cows eating more. This cow eating eight kilos only has a rumen capable of holding four kilos of NDF. So this red line is really what happens in a steam up ration. Okay, now here's what happens if we keep the energy the same. We now have the cow follow the green line until day of freshening, and she's still eating 13 plus kilos, putting six to seven kilos of NDF in her rumen, and now this green line takes off. You wanna get better fresh cows, you wanna prevent metritis mess, and you wanna prevent ketosis this, and milk fever, this green line compared to red line is exactly how we do it. Now I gave the charge to the group at Guelph Todd Duffield, uh, Kerry Lissamore, Steve LeBlanc, um, a year and a half ago at the, um, we presented the large herd chapters for large herd dairy management ebook. And I told them to go back to their cows in Kale and Gates. Well, they're seeing this and they're going to try and put a paper together, they told me, and put this out. But right now, if we can keep the energy the same, we get the green line. Now, that's the difference between ketosis, metritis, milk fever, and poor starts. Keep the energy the same in the close-up period. Keep the energy the same in the close-up period, and we'll have better fresh cows. Okay, we want the green line, not the red line. Okay, fresh cow starts. It's often been said that on the Goldilocks, well, you don't get DAs, Gordy, but you don't get great fresh cows. I'm going to show you a herd that we put on the fresh, on the Goldilocks diet. This graph on the y-axis, on the vertical axis, is first projection. This is the first milk test converted to once a year milk production. So that's a projection for first test. On the horizontal axis, are days in milk. So these cows here are 300 days in milk, but that's their first test. So this was the first test of cows 10 months ago. This is the first test of cows nine months ago. Eight, seven, six, you get the picture. Well, what do you see here? What you see here is this. For Six to eight months, we never had a fresh cow in this area where my red dot is. Now, the last two months when we switch to the Goldilocks diet, our new fresh cows are much higher. We've taught our fresh cows to eat more. Okay, now look at this herd. This is a herd with 4,000 fresh needs, 3,960. This was a year and a half ago. On March 1st, we implemented the Goldilocks diet. This herd had 4,000 fresh needs. Look at their ketosis. They bled every cow for BHBs and they got 886 positive ketosis. These were either full blown ketosis or subclinical. 340 fresh names, 119 ketosis cows. 270 fresh cows, 
92 ketosis is. March 1st, we implemented, on March 1st, we implemented the Goldilocks. Two weeks later, we still had 134 ketosis, but the next test, we had four, and then we had zero. So it goes like this. We switched from 25% of the herd getting subclinical or clinical ketosis to now not being able to find a positive ketosis. Look at DAs here, LDAs. The LDAs, they had 80. That's 2%. Not bad for a herd. Over those four months, they had 18 DAs. DAs are displaced abomasums. 12 DAs, 12 DAs, and now one and one. This herd now for the last year and, well, last three years now. The last clinical three years has been running the same kind of fresh cows. It's an amazing difference if we can make a fresh cow eat. And that's all there is to it. So here's the specifications for the dry cow diet. Cows will eat 11 to 13 kilos. We'll have a crude protein of somewhere between 13 and 15 percent. What I want is at least 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein to the average intake. Let me say that one more time. That's the important thing for colostrum. 1,200 grams metabolizable protein to the average intake. Okay, the NEL, none of you nutritionists use NELs anymore. I want you to back up, find that knob. 1.32 megacals per kilo. Okay, that's 0 0.60 megacals per pound for our English guys. The NDF is going to be 40 to 50%. The NDF from 4-H, I don't care about. The NFC, we want below 26%. The NDF from 4-H is going to be the same as my milk cow. We're going to teach a cow to eat six kilos of NDF. Her rumen is going to be full of fiber, and she's going to have the energy she needs. All right. Dry matter intake we've got. Do not add phosphorus to a cow. No phosphorus. I run my calciums 1.1, 1.2%. I give my average cow 125 to 150 grams of calcium. We're going to talk more about, I don't care how you do your mineral program. I don't care if you run high calcium, low calcium, or you run anionic salts. This diet works in all phases of mineral metabolism. If you make minerals work the way you're used to working it, It'll still work. Okay, just don't add phosphorus. I feed a high calcium diet without anionic salts. I used to use anionic salts and they work fine. Now here's the killer, magnesium. I need it greater than 0.36 and above four. I want your potassium as low as possible and I want your magnesium to potassium always to be one to four. If your magnesium slips below that, if you had a 1.6% potassium and you let your magnesium slip below 0.4, you will get grass tetany. You will get hypo magnesium cows that will be down and cannot get up. All right. NDF from 4 H, same kilos. I use 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein. Some of my dairies will use 1,000 grams most of the year, but as we get into the fall, autumn, as daylight decreases, we need to go up to at least 1,200 grams of metabolizable protein. And Tom Overton and his group at Cornell are recommending 1,400 grams of metabolizable protein, and they're not wrong. Uh, whatever it takes to get good colostrum, and it's usually high-quality protein. Okay. Now, troubleshooting close-up feeding. I want to feed bulky 4-H's, adequate effective NDF. I want to exercise, let the cows have a lot. Cow comfort, a well-bedded pack or clean stalls. Great water, 75 centimeters, 30 inches per head of bed space. All right, watch out for acidosis, grain ration. Watch out for low protein, excess soluble protein. 
low quality proteins. These are all the things that will hurt our colostrum. Low magnesiums with high potassiums will get you down cows that never get up. People who add phosphorus will get milk fever. Too much energy will get you DAs and metritis. Okay. Common pitfalls. The number one problem is sorting. This ration has to be shorter than a cow's mouth is wide. Poor quality forages might put them off feeds, mold, mycotoxins, too much potassium. Not understanding your forage wet chemistry mineral analysis. You need to know your feeds. Uh, no TMR delivery. If she starts to eat what she wants, cafeteria style, now you've got a new nutritionist at the bunk and you're gonna have a problem. Overcrowding, if they eat different rations because of overcrowding, you've got a problem. Okay, I want 320 milligrams of rumensin to the lowest intake cow if you're in a country that can feed rumensin. Uh, everybody who feeds Goldilocks, uh, I've had large dairies say this is the uh, price they have to pay. They have to get uh, a straw processor. We've got to reduce that straw to two and a half inches, uh, one centimeter. Okay. Um, this is an old phone, but look at our ration. So our ration has to be short enough that a cow can't tear it apart. Once I've achieved that, that's it. So dry cow management is the single most important phase of production. Our cows in the first 90 days, the first 100 days, will give one, will give 50% of their total milk. Three weeks from now, after feeding a Goldilocks dry cow diet, you can turn around the fresh cows. 90 days from now, you can have the whole herd average milk production up. Uh, three to four to six to eight pounds. It's amazing when we make better fresh cows, how well it goes. I truly think if I'm only allowed to do one ration on a herd, I'd want to do the dry cow ration. Dry cow management's the single most important phase of production. And with that, I got through my time and I've got enough time for questions. So uh, I hope it didn't go too fast. I tend to talk fast, especially when I'm alone like this. So if you got some questions, I'll look forward to something here in chat. So thank you very much again, uh, Marianne and AMTS. Thanks for inviting me. Oh, thank you, Gordy. I am going to take control for a few minutes and just introduce some of our additional things that we have going on, and then we'll start with some questions. I have some coming in already, and that's terrific, um, and I know Paula will have some. If you're in the audience, just remember, put your questions in the chat window, and I'll read them to Gordy. Paula will start putting her questions in, so if anything goes wrong or if she's busy translating, I'll read them for her. I want you to, to invite everybody to join us next month when we are joined by Dr. Marcia Endress, professor in the Department of Animal Science at the University of Minnesota. With an extension research appointment, her research interests include dairy management, welfare, and behavior. Her focus in recent years has been in the area of research and outreach in precision dairy technologies. She will present on milking cows with robots, and we've had a lot of requests for something about that. We're excited to have two presentations on animal behavior this year. In addition to Marcia's talk in July, we'll be joined by Trevor DeVries in September, who will talk about animal behavior. So again, remember to join us at 6 p.m. on July 11th. We're running another webinar series, and it's called The Beef Nutritionist. We launched it last month with a presentation by Ali Relling from The Ohio State, and we were joined earlier today with a talk by Dr. Alfredo Di Costanzo from the University of Minnesota on backgrounding. Dr. Danny Fox, Professor Emeritus from Cornell University, will speak on factors affecting performance of growing beef cattle in August on the 15th. Dr. Jonas Sartori from Texas Tech will speak on September 12th, and we will finish up the year with a talk on October 10th with Dr. Nicholas DiLorenzo from the University of Florida. His research focuses on minimizing the environmental impacts of feeding dairy cattle. Our beef webinars will be presented in English and Spanish with Paula Torillo co-hosting from Argentina. We're thankful for our series sponsors, AMTS, 
AB Vista and AB Vista for the English language webinar and Rock River Lab and Bio4 Argentina for the Argentinian webinar. The Beef Nutritionist webinars are held at 1 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time with a varying schedule date. It's usually the Wednesday of our regular nutritionist webinar, but in August we're going to have it the following Wednesdays. If you are interested, please email webinars at agmodelsystems.com. I would really like to thank my co-hosts and the people who make this possible. AMTS USA and Global, Paula Torillo in Argentina, and a special thank you to Rock River Laboratory and DSM who are sponsoring the Spanish language webinar. Tom Long joins us from Hemingway in China. We are also especially thankful to the generous sponsors that make it able for us to continue to do these. We thank our gold sponsors, Ajinomoto Heartland, Superior Nutrition Through Amino Acids, makers of Agipro L, and Arm & Hammer Animal Health, the makers of cattle feed ingredients that optimize dairy cow health. Our silver sponsors are Dairyland Laboratories, Virtus, makers of Strata with EPA, DHA Omega-3s, and Prequil with Omega-6s, Cumberland Valley Analytical Services, Kemen, featuring USA Lysine, Dairy One Forge Laboratory, R&D Life Sciences, and AB Vista. Our bronze sponsors are Amino Max, Purdue Agribusiness, Jeffo Quality, Feel, Jeffo, comma, <laughs> Quality Feeds, Adiseo, Origination Inc. and Novitas, maker of makers of Nova Meal. I'm now going to open the floor up to questions. I have some in my windows, and I think I will be reading the questions that come from Tom Long in China. So um, I'm going to open your mic back up, Gordy. And I can hear you. Excellent. Good. All right. The first question that I'm going to start with is from Aiden Kushnahan, and I believe Aiden might be from the UK. I'm not positive. Can I replicate the Goldilocks diet if I only have access to grazed grass or grass silage as a source of forage? No corn silage or whole crop cereal silage is available. Sure. If you, so you could all hear the question. I won't need to repeat it. In my history is always let's repeat the question. But can we do it in other parts of the world that doesn't have corn silage, barley silage, or whole crop silage? The answer is sure. We really, there's a hidden question under there. The hidden question is, do we have to adapt the rumen to starch digesters? And the answer is no. So as long as you can lower the energy in England to 1.32 kilo, 1.32 megacals per kilo of dry matter intake, I've done it historically. We did this diet with alfalfa haylage cut late, oat leach cut done, and no corn silage. So we did it historically in the beginning without any corn silage, so we sure can. And don't add starch. The starch digesters, the starch bugs, will find a way as soon as the cow's fresh to multiply. They love a party. You give them carbohydrates, they'll multiply. Two will become four, eight, 16, 32, 64, 128, et cetera, and you'll have all the starch bugs you need. So uh, in a grass world, you what you got to do is not use great grass because you've got to find grass where you can get your whole average energy below 1.32. So it works fine. Okay, thanks. Um, I'm going to give Paula an opportunity to ask some questions while I look at some of the other ones that have come in. Paula, go ahead. Yes, I'm here. He hello, Gordy. Hello, Paula. Uh, I have many questions. <laughs> The first one is from Leonardo. What kind of straw do you recommend to use? You know, most people will end up with wheat straw, but barley straw, oat straw will work fine. And in northern Wisconsin, um, even marsh hay can work. Uh, things that are harvested from uh, the marshes in dry cow periods, in very dry periods. So we can make any low, high quality, highly palatable, low energy straw work well. So this is from Tom Long, and I want to remind you that Tom is asking from China, so there might be some different um, situations there in regards to forages. But his question is, what about the price of feed with more forage feed, can it be cheaper? Not only will the ration be cheaper with more forage, but adding low 
NDF4Hs to a ration increases the ration's energy. So what do we do when we have the high price of feed, when starch goes up, when corn prices go up? If we increase the quality of the NDF, that is lower the NDF in our forages, we get more of that into the ration and that part of the ration, which is forage, now has more energy in it. And the ration in total has more energy in it. These herds that are achieving a herd like Jeff Horson's in Northeast Wisconsin, he's above 115, 118 pounds per cow. He's got a 60 plus, I, I was there within a week ago. He's above a 60% for each ration and has the most energy in his ration. So with high prices of feed, more forage fed, it can not only be cheaper, it's got more energy. And another question from Tom Long that came along is, can the ebook that Gordy mentioned from American Dairy Science Association be shared or available? The answer is ADSA, American Dairy Science Association, sells that book. It's called the ebook, the um, Large Herd Dairy Management. There's more than 47 authors in it, and I just happen to be the author, co-author of two chapters. Okay, so, and Gordy, when I send out the link for the recording, I'll send. A, I'll make sure that I send a, a link to that. I made a note to myself. Great. Okay. Great. Um, let's see. I'm going to ask another question while I have the mic open. Um, one of the I had a comment question. Um, it, from Blair Vilmalaya, I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, could a copy of your dry cow programs be emailed? Um, do you mind if I turn this presentation into a PDF? Please turn it into a PDF and email it to them. Okay, very good. And we'll actually, we can put a link up on our website when I get everything processed so that it's, it's there and people can download it, if you don't sure. mind. That's fine. A question comes from Tom Long again, all panelists. Can we not use alfalfa at all and still achieve this ration? You bet. So we can use grass forages, we can use straw and corn silage. A lot of the Ontario boys, uh, the Ontario farms in um, that belt of dairymen have adopted the Goldilocks and they use mostly straw and corn silage. Uh, so the people who ask, do we have to use corn silage? No, we don't have to. Do we have to uh, use alfalfa? No. All you got to do is lower the energy and make a cow eat more. And she will eat more. And one of the dangers that people fall into, Marianne, is I just noticed it on, on one of my great herds. His last fresh cows in February and March were lower first milks than he had been doing for a year. And I looked at him and said, Jeff, you added energy to your dry cow ration. And he said, yes, I did. The nutritionist told me it was cold. The cows needed more energy. Well, guess what? If it's cold, they'll eat more. So what he did when he had corn was just what we saw on the red line of those graphs we played with. Uh, what they did was he added energy, he lowered his own intake, and now his fresh cows eat less. And now he was down on his first milks. And I made him write a note on the wall, never, never add corn to cows in cold weather. So uh, don't add energy to these dry cow diets. Good, good. Um, I'm going to let Paula ask some questions. Paula, I'm going to unmute you, so be ready. Go ahead, Paula. Okay. Uh, do you use the same protein supplements in dry cows and milking cows? And so, there is an... Go ahead. Okay. And how important do you think the fat in the diet is and which would be the ideal level for you? So I don't add any fat to answer the second part first. I don't add any fat other than basal fat in my corn silage to my dry cow diet. Do not add energy to your dry cow diet in any form, fat or uh, starch and carbohydrate. <laughs> So the fat in the milk cow ration is, you can be a nutritionist and add fat. I do to my milk cow rations and I'll add protected fats. Now back to the protein, we use often the same high quality proteins in my dry cow diets, soybean meals, heat treated soybean meals, heat treated canola, and, um, and gluten meal across of Europe, high 66% uh, protein gluten meals in Europe, and in the U.S. where it's legal, 
we'll add a half pound of blood meal. Uh, if blood meal is not legal, we're still using the same proteins we use for milk cows. Exactly. Matthias, and he said, in close-up diets, which DCAD do you want? And can you make more comments about anionic salts, which absolutely mimics the comment from Jose Alpazar, who said, um, would, or no, I'm sorry, this, yeah, Jose said, could you talk more about anionic salts? So there you go. There's a couple anionic salt questions. Go away with them. Okay. I'm going to say that when we started this diet and when we did it at Fair Oaks, 18 years ago, gosh, that's a long time ago, in the year 2000, we were doing this diet at Fair Oaks and we were using anionic salts and we were using enough anionic salts to affect a change in urine pH just the way you would. And we would test it weekly. If we needed more to keep the pH changed the way we wanted it, I'm not gonna teach you to be an anionicist, but we did what we did. When I got to my herd six years later, I had a Jersey herd. Jersey cows get more milk fever than Holsteins. So I knew I had to watch my little Jerseys for milk fever. And yet I had more than a thousand, when I started with the first thousand cows, I only had second calf animals. Whoops, let me say that again. I only had two year old animals. I only had first calf heifers. I had a young herd. It it was an expansion herd. It was a, a put together herd of babies. So they don't get milk fever. So I started my dry cow diet up at Fair, up at Central Sands without any anionic salts in the year 2007. And in my five years on my dairy, I never added anionic salts even as I matured the herd. So what I'm telling you is anionic salts work well with this diet. You get to be the nutritionist and do what you know how to do with anionic salts. And if you choose not to use anionic salts, feed the high calcium I'm showing you, 126 to 150 grams, and I don't have a milk fever problem with jerseys. So I can do it either way. Okay, I'm going to follow up with one more question from Jose Alpazar on anionic salts. Um, he said, in the case of tropical conditions where the potassium is higher than 3%, would it be recommended? Would you then recommend the use of anionic salts? I haven't had to deal with that ration, so I'm not sure. This is when somebody has to finally say they heard Gordy Jones say, I don't know. Well, I would say I don't think anybody would call Wisconsin temperate type climates um, uh, tropical. So, but <laughs> if my ma if my potassium was three, my magnesium would be one to four. I would be huge on my mag. I would make sure that's up there, and most of that mag would be mag sulfate. So you're putting in a mild anionic salt to begin with. So uh, I would still watch it with that. Yes. So I'd probably use anionic salts down there. Okay, I have a question from Sebastian. You emphasized metabolizable protein in the diet. Do you consider amino acid balance basically the lysine to methionine ratio of about 2.7 to 1? Uh, whatever gets you the most metabolizable protein in your dry cow diet. I haven't, I'll use an AMTS dry cow or nutrition program. And so I would love to optimize my methionine lysine level. But if I can't do that, I'll overwhelm the cow and just give her more protein so I get there. So you can get there both, but she needs that much metabolizable protein to make, cal or to make colostrum. Some pretty sharp okay. nutritionists out there, so that's great. Handle some. I, I have one more. Okay. Uh, this is from Matthias. When you talk about feeding alfalfa, do you consider potassium levels? Aren't those values high? Say again. I missed the first part. When you talk about feeding alfalfa, do you consider potassium levels? Aren't those values high? So if I use a lot of uh, local alfalfa in Wisconsin, the potassium levels will be very high. Yes. I've seen rations at 1.6 or higher, not 3% like somebody quoted in Tropical. But at my 1.6% potassium ration, I'll make sure my mag is at 0.4 or higher. 
So, uh, and if I'm always going to be at 1.6, I'd have my magnesium at 0.45 to make sure that I always had enough magnesium to be 1 to 4 to my potassium. Uh, the alfalfa I get here for dry cows is usually from northern Wisconsin. It's first crop that was cut late in July. So they go for volume. It's half grassy, and it's not real high in potassium. Um, Gordy, I've got a couple of questions also with that refer to alfalfa. So um, Lawson Spicer, who's in California, he asks about alfalfa hay maybe in the more of the California tradition than the type that you're using. And then if I can find it, um, I think Tom Long also had a comment about alfalfa. Um, I think it was just if if you use alfalfa, can you still achieve that balance? So there's a lot of people out there feeding alfalfa that want to sort of nail down what what your recommendations would be in that regard, so I'm guessing. Okay, so one of the problems with great alfalfa, whether it's milk cow, whether it's hay or haylage, is that the energy, I'm going to stay stick in pounds right now because the energy is 0.65 megacals per pound. So 0.65 times 2.2 equals 1.44, uh, roughly. 1.44 is higher than my 132. So you've got to dilute it down. So alfalfa has young alfalfa, good alfalfa hay, and good alfalfa hay have too high an energy for this diet until you dilute it. But low energy alfalfa, mature alfalfa, can have the energies we need. Um, most people don't make poor milk quality alfalfa. But if you've got poor quality alfalfa, it can go into this diet as long as it's palatable. So alfalfa can work. In fact, the place where we discovered Goldilocks was in Northeast Wisconsin. And at that time, in the 90s, we figured this out. We didn't publish anything, but most of my diets were heavy to alfalfa. But you can do it with or without alfalfa. So I'm not hung up on alfalfa, team. What we can do is just lower the energy. I'm hung up on that. Okay, thank you. Um, I have a question from Harry Bristol. Um, and this is in regards to, you spoke a lot about NDF. He says, is there an effect on intakes in energy based on the UNDF of the forage? So um, your six kilograms, I think, believe for, for, for dry matter, kind of address that. That was something that Miner did some research on, wasn't it? Yeah, and I, I, I can't pull that out of my head right now. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write myself a note that I've got to look it up. I better not answer. I, I don't know. Okay. I know that some of that was um, some preliminary research that was based on some very specific type diets that were fed to like the Parmigiano Reggiano herds in um, the Parma region Italy. of Italy. Yeah. So they're going to be heavy on the the alfalfa, um, no corn silage, um, no ensiled feeds. So that right. that might be. I think that's where they found the relationship strongest. So okay, and, yeah. I see two questions from Tom that come up on my chart. Is the same ration okay and tested at low latitudes? The answer is absolutely yes. And the other is, do I care of the color of alfalfa or oat hay at all? And oat hay is a wonderful feed. Uh, too many Chinese dairymen buy color of alfalfa. No, I don't care of the color. As long as it tests fine, I'm okay. And oat hay is a wonderful dilutant to this uh, diet. Uh, you just gotta worry that oat hay has too many oats in it. So suddenly it goes up in energy. Okay. Uh, my email is right there. If you do have any other questions, uh, as I've told the world many times, I love to get email. And as Marianne will tell you, I never answer it. Uh, <laughs> it takes a while. It takes a while. Tom, I'm going to unmute you and let you say say a word or two. Yes, I'm here. Thank you very much, Gordy. It's a great, great uh, seminar. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. You're kind. We will thank you very much. It was terrific to have you talk for us. Um, thanks for all that you shared. You make it sound easy. <laughs> uh, in fact, it really is easy, team. So go, go help cows, people. Yes. Thanks very much, everybody. Have a great evening. And um, 
we'll talk to you next month. Thanks a okay, lot. Okay, Marianne. Us. Thanks again for the invitation. Thank you, AMTS. And uh, we'll talk to everybody again in your farm. Take care. Yep. Thanks, Paula. Thanks, Tom. Bye.